Hello, everyone. I'm Judith Alberts. Welcome to Learn and Grow series. This is our premier um, online event. So bear with us a bit on housekeeping. Uh, yes, we are recording. And we will, if all goes well, we will send you a link to the replay within 24 hours. And if it really goes well, we might even post it publicly on YouTube. Okay, so now your confirmation email um, included links to download resource information. And that information is also in the chat. If you are not muted, please mute yourself and use the chat box for questions and Adrian will um, answer them at the end. So now, please, as I said, please bear with us because we are volunteers and this is our first time trying to do this live and recorded. So at any rate, about the garden. As I looked through the registration list, there were lots of names that I recognized, a lot of names that I did not. So I, I'm, I suspect that not everyone knows that much about the garden. So here's a brief intro, bear with me. First of all, the Williamsburg Botanical Garden is tiny. It's only two acres, and it's in, actually inside a traffic circle on the road to the parking lot at Freedom Park. But those two acres really pack a lot of punch. We have 18 different types of habitat, including things like the pollinator meadow, of course, woodlands, an English cottage style garden, wetlands, succulents, and there is even a fairy garden, which is very, very sweet to look at. Now the plantings in the garden are, are intended to be natural, not what you would expect of a botanical garden with you know all of that heavy meaning behind those words because it is most definitely not a manicured setting with a display of you know exotic plants that are high maintenance it's more like a wild child and uh, its emphasis is on um, native plants we are a monarch butterfly way station, number 3394. And if you have never been to the garden before, please do come and visit and visit often. I mean, you can spend 10 minutes in the garden and think that you've seen it all, or you can be like a lot of us, especially those of us with cameras, where it's like all of a sudden, two hours later, we go, wow, why am I so hungry? So, you know, please come and visit. The garden's mission is to demonstrate, and this I'm going to read, environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening best practices and to offer education on related topics. Everything that you see in the garden is dug, planted, divided, built and rebuilt, weeded and watered by dedicated volunteers on a very slim budget indeed. So here comes the pitch. The garden, and especially the Williamsburg Botanical Garden, is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. We receive no funding from any government agency, so we rely on memberships and donations. Our learning grow programs are free, and under normal circumstances, we'd be meeting you at the door at the Interpretive Center and there'd be a donations jar there to cheerfully accept your donations. But obviously that's a little harder online and asking a $5 donation by the time you're done with PayPal, fees, et cetera, et cetera, it's really not worth it. So if you'd like to support the garden, we certainly ask you to consider a membership, WilliamsburgBotanicalGarden.org. And the advantage of a membership is that you will receive advance notice of our upcoming events and you're going to get good vibes from the universe and get that you know that nice warm feeling in the cockles of your heart so COVID-19 has thrown all of us for a loop and first 
I certainly hope that everyone that you know and love has been well and remains well. But I think all of us know someone who has been affected by the health situation. We are working at rescheduling our Learn and Grow programs to go online. Adrian, bless her heart, and I mean that in the best way, not the Southern way, is, uh, is our first brave, brave speaker. So we'll send out those announcements and uh, remember, garden members get first crack. So COVID-19, how has it affected the garden? Well, our spring plant sale, Plants with a Purpose, um, was scheduled for April 25th. We had a committee working very hard, pulling things together, and then poof, we just it just had to be canceled entirely. So instead, we went to using our honor box area to a much greater extent. And we've been bringing plants into the garden um, over the last, since, April 29th, I have sent out seven separate emails to a special email list um, with updates as to what's in the garden. And boy, some, one of the uh, other board members was there and she texted me and she said, holy moly, it's 8.15 in the morning and there, there are two families here shopping. So it has been gratefully quite successful. Thank you to all of the volunteers who have worked so hard on that. So um, in your email, follow-up email to this session, I'll include the link to sign up if you want to get that update. Last item, before I introduce Adrian officially, Master Gardeners, you get to report an hour of continuing education. So it is my pleasure to introduce Adrian Frank as our first Williamsburg Botanical Garden Learn and Grow online program. She is a brave lady. Adrian is a member and past president of the Historic Rivers Chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalists, a member of the John Clayton Chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society, current secretary at the Friends of Dragon Run, and she is a longtime volunteer at the garden. She's been learning about butterflies for more than 10 years through uh, butterfly count participation, collecting data on um, local butterflies, including their host plants, behaviors, and recording sightings. She is the coordinator for the annual Williamsburg area butterfly count, which I was so disappointed I couldn't, couldn't participate in last year. Um, and that butterfly count is an official count associated with the North American Butterfly Association. So welcome to Adrian, and she's gonna start sharing her screen. Take it away, Adrian. <coughs> Let's see if it works. Can everybody see it? I cannot see me on the side. I see your uh, presentation. Good, good. Okay. If everyone wants to... Um, okay, I'm good now. Okay, very good. All right, so um, just a, a little bit about the, this presentation. Uh, the majority of the photographs are taken locally and um, with a little bit of research that we have done as a group of butterfly uh, enthusiasts, um, we've collected information over time about, especially about the butterflies. Uh, for this presentation, I added some on bees and got a little bit of help with some photographs from my entomologist friend, Ken. Uh, and I wanted to also thank all of the people who have sent me photographs. Some of them have sent me photographs for me to identify things. And then I've very conveniently used some of their photographs in this presentation. So I just wanted to kind of let everybody know about that. 
So if you can see um, here the picture of the, um, I'm going to go back one second, um, the thistle, that is not a native thistle, uh, that's a bull thistle, um, but it's a wonderful attractant uh, in, in our garden and most of the pictures, close-up pictures are really from our garden, my garden and Gary's garden in Williamsburg. So what makes a good pollinator? Um, good pollinator is able to travel from flower to flower and they go to a variety of flower sources and they have hairs. So if you look at the picture, you can see that this bee, and it's a honey bee, is just covered with pollen because bees have hairs all over their body. They also have very specialized mouth parts. And I don't know whether you can see uh, there or not, but the, the bee is extending its mouth, mouth part into uh, the flower. They collect pollen on hairs and they've got hairs on their legs. And when they collect hairs on their legs, sometimes it looks like they have chaps on. Uh, they're so heavy with pollen. So here's a close up um, from my friend Ken, who uh, showed the picture of the tongue of this uh, honeybee and it's working on uh, the cell and making the cell good for putting in the, um, the honey itself. So it's cleaning with its tongue. And this bee has a relatively long tongue. All the different kinds of bees have varying length tongues and antenna. If you look at a, a butterfly, butterfly has a proboscis and it collects nectar. Typically they're flying around and the proboscis is all curled up. And when they get to the flower, um, they will unfoil their proboscis. Uh, it, acts like a straw, but more like wicking, if you think about a paper towel, and it wicks up the pollen um, and the nectar from, from the plants. So what, what makes a good pollinator, and are any of these things good pollinators? So we have a Katie did here in a mallow, a rose mallow, and it probably is bringing out some pollen with it. If it goes to another flower, probably can bring pollen and put it in the other flower. But it's really not made to be a pollinator. Uh, the caterpillar is a tomato hornworm. Um, it would be a very good uh, pollinator as a moth. And this is the picture of the adult moth, a, a hawk moth. Um, but it's not going to get too far because it has eggs of wasps. All, on, all over its back. And so it's probably going to die a slow, miserable death. Poor thing. Um, there are two pictures of predators here. So you have a wasp and a dragonfly, and their body structure is very different. And they're all about taking care of the the, uh, the other insects, eating the other insects, and they are a natural control uh, for the insects. So what are the pollinators? Bees, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, birds, and bats. They are designed and have special ways of collecting pollen. Uh, they have preference for flowers by sight and smell and size and access. So for example, a fly um, is able to get into some flowers that other insects are not able to get into. They, they'll sneak in and out of some of the, the uh, smelly flowers uh, that have like trap doors on them. If you think about a hummingbird, they are flying in the day and they're attracted to the red orange of the trumpet vine, but bats like the musty odors and flowers that open at night. So here is a night blooming uh, angel trumpet. This was next to our porch and I think it might have some porch light reflected on it. Um, but it is uh, a, an attractor for the moths that are out at night. Some of these moths were actually on our um, porch. So the moths are attracted to the duller colors, but they like the really smelly, sweet smelly ones. And this angel trumpet is very um, smelly. <laughs> uh, 
uh, day active moths like the clear wing moth here and this owlet um, are attracted to the brighter uh, uh, flowers, the br brighter colors and the, and the nice pleasant, more pleasant odors of the flowers that are out in the daytime. Beetles prefer bright white, yellow, and blue. At least that's what it says in the book. Um, but in our yard, we've got soldier, soldier, soldier beetles and um, Japanese beetles going on some of the red flowers. Uh, insects really like to have, especially butterflies and bees, like to have flowers that have landing pads. And this Mexican sunflower is a really good example of what a, a landing pad looks like. Uh, honeybees, we have, um, they were in, imported 400 years ago and they pollinate all, almost all of our crops. And so um, no bees, no ice cream. So we, we depend on bees and we know that bees are having collapse, hive collapse problems. They like goldenrod. Goldenrod has very small little flowers and there are actually 14 types of goldenrod in the Williamsburg Botanical Garden. So you could have a day in the fall or the late summer just looking at the goldenrods. Um, native bees, there are 4,000 species of native, native ground bees and twig bees, twig nesting bees in the United States. And they pollinate 70% of all of the flowering plants. They're more likely to go to the native plants. They are designed um, by nature to go to certain plants and there are some bees that only go to one flowering plant. So if we get rid of and we lose a plant, we lose the bee. And we also, the other way around, you might lose uh, uh, the bee and then you wouldn't have the ability of that flower um, to, uh, to continue on. So the bees um, all have a lot of hair that they can carry um, the pollen with, and they have tongues of varying length uh, so that they can um, go to different types of flowers. And um, they re reproduce well um, when there's a lot of abundant pollen. Bees prefer white, yellow, or blue flowers with ultraviolet patterns, um, pleasant odors, and with a landing pad. So today, um, I noticed in one of the books that the false, uh, this uh, beard tongue or penstemon uh, was a great flower in May for bees. So I walked outside and there was the penstemon and there was a bumblebee so I could take a picture this morning. Um, fossil evidence indicates that bees started pollinating flowers 125 million years ago. And we've only had sunflowers for about 50 million years. And the bees found it and have been pollinating it ever since. And I think this was one of the photographs that we won an award for, so I stuck it in because it's pretty. Native bees. You have bumblebees that form colonies and nest underground. Mason bees. Some people um, make, we had uh, like a Girl Scout make mason bee um, houses and put them up over it in York River State Park. So they like cylinders and cavities. Carpenter bees and solitary bees nest in wood. Um, we have salt treated uh, four by four timbers in our yard and we have carpenter bees that have dug holes right through the timber um, and they uh, spend a lot of time buzzing our heads. Digger bees and, and polyester bees and Sweat bees um, are all um, names of bees related to their function. Um, and all of these bees were named uh, prior to genetics. Well, when they started doing genetics, they found out that bees um, differ by all of these characteristics 
and that in and there are big six big families of bees um, and in each one of those families you might have a mason bee type a sweat bee type um, a bumblebee type uh, you have to look really closely you have to have a specimen and look at its facial features tongue wings um, hair body um, and watch its behavior in order to figure out which family of bees uh, they're in. Bees versus other insects. They have long slender antenna. They have eyes on the sides of their head, but they may also have other little tiny eyes kind of towards the back of their head. They have a distinct separated thorax and abdomen and four wings, stout legs with pollen collecting hairs, and they usually don't have spines on their body. Here we have a, a bumblebee and a sweat bee, and this little green bee with the lines on it, this is a really magnified picture. This is one of the smallest bees that we have in North America, and it just happened to be in our yard. Wasps. They're very poor pollinators. They have narrow bodies, long legs with spines. They usually don't have any hair on them, um, except that they might have some uh, silk, little silk, uh, silver hairs on their face. Uh, but these two wasps, you can't really see uh, if they have any hairs, but you can see the spines on their legs and they are a good control for other insects. Flies um, are good pollinators. They have a lot of hair on them. I mean, if you look at this bee fly here, um, it is just covered with hair, so it's a very good pollinator. Um, flies often like pawpaw flowers, and pawpaws are usually um, pollinated by flies or by beetles. Um, and they have a nice strong smell, kind of like a dead animal. And so you know that the flies are attracted to that. Um, this was an interesting bug, this little nocturnal horsefly. I found a picture of it and I had on, on my, in my collection of photographs, I had no idea what it was. And I asked our entomologist friend to identify it. And he said that he has just about never seen this because it's a nocturnal fly. You can see it has no color because it flies at night. It doesn't need it. The robber fly on the bumblebee, so there's, there's a bumblebee under there, but the robber fly is actually got his jaws in the neck of the, of the bumblebee and is killing the bumblebee. So that was just another part of life in the garden. Bee nesting. Ground nesting bees like unpaved earth, moist areas, moist earthy areas, mounds for sunbathing. You can build a sand pit or a pile and you'll, you'll collect ground nesting bees. Twig nesting bees are uh, likely to go to dry plant stalks or logs or stumps. Um, and then it suggests uh, in one of these great books, that if you uh, provide material, you should let it stay out for, for over a year because the, the um, bees are gonna be in that material. They're gonna be wintering over in the material. Pollinator homes. You can build a bundle. And if the bundle is, the, each one of those bundles is sealed at the end, then the bees, little bees, mason bees will crawl in and they will seal up the end um, with uh, some material from their mouths. Um, and, uh, and then you know that you've got a bee inside nesting in there and then they'll dig themselves out. Um, you can put some uh, twigs and, and grass, uh, you know, tubes of grass into a PVC pipe. Um, but you do want to change your material every once in a while, just like you want to clean your hummingbird feeders. 
here's the pollinator house that's over at the Williamsburg Botanical Garden. And you can see all of the different kinds of holes um, and cavities that uh, the pollinators can use. So you can, you can get a, um, several different examples of pollinator houses on, on the internet. Butterflies. Butterflies are uh, plant specialists and they're, they have preferences for which um, flowers, which type of flower they go to. So uh, the little checkered skipper on crown beard, well crown beard has very small little short um, flowers. So their proboscis, if you can see it up here, very thin little proboscis, can easily reach into that. It's amazing how the skipper, this uh, Dion skipper, uh, it's its tongue, its proboscis, is almost as big as its body. It's so long. So that they can get into these tubular uh, flowers more easily. Uh, butterfly weed is a wonderful attractant, and it's a, it's a great nectar plant. It's not only a host plant, it's a nectar plant, and there was at least 10 to 12 uh, zebra swallowtails on that. Um, plant in our yard. There are uh, 13 types of butterflies, um, but they're not all in our area. And um, if you look here, you can see that swallowtails are here, but the partisans are mostly like out west and they're up in the mountains and they're usually small or white butterflies. Uh, if you look here, the harvester we have, but coppers we don't have, but they are in the mountains of Virginia. Same thing with checkered spots. You can find them in the uh, top of the Appalachians, but um, you won't find them down here. Same thing with the metal marks. But the long tails and the giant skippers are all much farther south. Swallowtails. Um, are the typical butterflies that we think of. Uh, they're big and they're beautiful. And these three are ones that you often find in your garden. So if you have plants that they like, like butterfly weed and cardinal flower, um, <clears throat> you're gonna get these butterflies. The, uh, the ones that we see most often in our yard that um, you see the caterpillars uh, are the black, uh, swallowtail because they their host plants are things like parsley and dill um, and then uh, the tiger swallowtail which is next um, that that's its its host plant is trees and um, one year we were looking at some of the trees in the neighborhood and we noticed that all of the tops of the trees, all the brand new leaves on the trees were beginning to disappear and couldn't figure out what was going on. We thought maybe the trees had a disease or something. But several months later, we found um, uh, it was the best year for Eastern Tiger Swallowtails that we'd ever had. They were just everywhere. They were flying all over the place. So they were, um, the, they were flying up to the top of the tulip poplar trees, laying all of their eggs, and then the, the caterpillars, of course, are eating the leaves of the tulip poplar. So you can see that some butterflies look different. Uh, the male and the female look different. So the male here doesn't have the blue, but the female has the blue. Um, sometimes with this morph, you can see these kind of um, tiger stripes, faded stripes uh, in here, so you know right away that it is a, a tiger and not one of the other um, swallowtails. We've been doing um, a, uh, an annotated list. So there's a group of 
butterfly enthusiasts who've been working hard to uh, compile information about all the different butterflies that we've seen. And in the last five years, we've re recorded 94 uh, butterflies in our area. We've kind of figured out uh, what months they fly in. Um, we've identified what the plants were, that there were host plants um, or what they used. And then we added a little bit of information on each one of the butterflies. Swallowtails have a variety of hosts. Most of them are trees or, um, or bushes, but pipe vines, pipe vine volo uh, swallowtails like pipe vines, um, zebras like pawpaw, um, the black swallowtail is going to be um, laying eggs in your garden on your garden plants and uh, the, the eastern tiger swallowtail uh, actually has several trees that it might use. Spice bush uses a spice bush uh, and palamedes. You only find the palamedes in place where there are red bay bushes and our uh, Jamestown Island uh, has red bay bushes so uh, there's uh, often a lot of palamedes flying there during the summer. This is what happens when you have a butterfly lay eggs on a plant that they really like. Um, so this, we had the, these um, black swallowtail caterpillars on um, some of our garden plants like parsley um, and they ate it all. So we took some of the caterpillars and we put it on their next favorite plant, which was rue. And then they ate the rue plant completely down. Uh, whites and sulfurs are a, another family of butterflies. The cabbage white is the only kind of uh, imported invasive species, as you might say. Um, it can, it's from Asia, but because it likes crops. It's everywhere in the world. Uh, so it likes mustards um, and it, so it's, you know, broccoli fields. So if you go to the eastern shore of Virginia or where somebody's not using a lot of um, pesticides, uh, you'll just see hundreds and hundreds of uh, cabbage whites flying. But there are also uh, cloudless sulfurs and orange sulfurs and little yellow sulfurs. And this is just to give you an idea of the size. So the cloudless sulfur can be two inches um, from top to bottom. The hosts for the sulfur are mustards um, and then the clouded sulfur and the little yellow and the cloudless sulfur and sleepy orange, they kind of like these other two plants. Um, and uh, this caterpillar is a cloudless sulfur caterpillar, and it's on the partridge pea. Gossamer winged butterflies are named because they have <clears throat> beautiful, um, fine little tails, most of them. Um, and so they're very light and dainty little butterflies. And they're the largest group of butterflies in the world. There are kind of three around here, the blues, the hair streaks, and the harvester is kind of all by itself. The harvester is fairly rare in our area, but its caterpillars um, eat aphids. So it's the only one that is eating um, another insect and not just using plants. So the blues, um, we have two in this area, the eastern-tailed blue and the azure. And the eastern-tailed blue usually flies around in the grass and the azures usually fly up a little bit higher uh, in the trees, but they always break those rules. Um, hosts for butterflies, legumes, um, some woody plants, and um, some of the azures do like the, uh, the hollies, the inkberry and the hollies. These are the beautiful hair streaks and they're about my favorite. They're very small, um, 
but they have um, these short little narrow tails and they have the, the eye spots at the end of their tails. So if I had you as an audience and you could talk, I would ask you why um, does the butterfly have eyes near their tail? And why does the tail kind of move back and forth and back and forth? Um, and it's because uh, their predator will go here first and take a bite out of this tail rather than the, than the, uh, but the head of the butterfly. So often you'll see um, butterflies and this area will, there'll be a big bite out of it. Hosts for hair streaks. So you have um, some trees, lots of trees, mallows, legumes, uh, great purple hair streak um, is the American mistletoe. Um, so if uh, you usually think of mistletoe being in swamps, but there's a big tree in Colonial Williamsburg, a really old tree, and it just has tons and tons of mistletoe all over it. And folks have seen uh, great purple hair streaks right down in Colonial Williamsburg. Fritillaries. Fritillaries, the hosts for fritillaries are passion vines, violets, and flex. And we've seen um, these variegated fritillaries lay eggs on the violets in our lawn. <clears throat> Pearl crescents, they're small, fast flying, um, usually with spread wings. And a little bit earlier this spring, uh, Shirley was over at War Hill Sports Complex. She counted 61 uh, pearl crescents in, in an afternoon. Um, and then we had the frost, the freeze that hit, and all of it like, seems like all of the butterflies and a lot of our insects have kind of disappeared. Um, we had, we've had very um, low uh, insects recently. Another group are the brushfoots and the family. Um, the reason they're called brushfoots is because they have a reduced non-functional forelegs and they're folded at their breast. Um, they have, there's different sizes of them and some have ir irregular wing shapes and we call them angle wings. And typically um, their flight patterns are that they will fly, flap and glide fly and glide. Um, so each one of the butterflies has different ways that they interact, ways that they interact with plants, um, their behaviors, um, where, uh, where they hang out, um, and uh, how they fly and how they interact with each other. So here are the angle wings, the comma and the question mark, and they're called that because of this tiny little um, pattern on their closed wings. So the question mark has a comma and a dot, and the comma just has the comma. Hosts for uh, some of the brush foots include hops. So if you're growing hops, I know that the Botanical Garden has a, a large hops uh, growing. Uh, nettles, thistles, American lady likes plantain leaved uh, pussy toes. And these are the pussy toes. They're, they're tiny little things, but uh, we um, tried to get some of those in our yard and they spread fairly well. We put them all around the bottom of a post and they're spreading out slowly over time. Uh, so some of the butterflies love sap. So these red spotted purples are on the, on the sap of this tree. Um, a buckeye was uh, named after the buckeye tree. And red admirals, they have a little bit of a different um, uh, interaction. They, their host plant is nettles. Uh, and they might be in the forest or on the forest edges. Whereas like the common buckeye you'll see out in the grass. Host plants, cherry, willow, cottonwood. Here's a picture of plantain. I got that today. Um, nettles, 
Viceroy likes willows and cottonwood. So some of you have seen this before. So you're going to feel pretty stupid if it turns out you're not a monarch. And so here's the monarch and here is the mimic. The Viceroy is a mimic of the monarch, but you can see that the Viceroy has an extra line on it and it's a little bit smaller. So why do you think the Viceroy wants to look like a monarch? Um, it's because the monarch is eating milkweed and milkweed has a tendency to be toxic. Uh, and so the butterfly, uh, the colors of the butterfly in, uh, tell predators, I'm toxic, don't eat me. Uh, so the monarch butterfly can, can fly really slowly and it doesn't care so much. Whereas some of the other butterflies are like, and they're gone because they have the, this defense of coloring. So their host plants are milkweeds. You've got common milkweed and swamp milkweed and butterfly weed, but there's also a little vine. So what, what is a milkweed? A milkweed is when you break it, milk comes out and they're all kind of related. They're all a little toxic, but the sand vine and the honey vine could be one of the major hosts uh, for monarchs in our area. So this is what a monarch, monarch caterpillars will do to butterfly weed. They ate so much of this that we lost the plant. We had a really large one um, and it was all gone after they got done with it. They liked every single bit of that plant. Satyrs, they're small, medium-sized butterflies floppy flight and they're found mostly in the woods. Our yard um, backs up on a ravine. It's all wooded in the back and so we'll see these some of these little satyrs coming into the yard uh, on a fairly regular basis. But they don't really go to flowers. They like the to go to sap on trees and uh, get nourishment from the ground and from, from uh, leaves that are on the ground, et cetera. This gives you an idea about these woodland butterflies and what they look like and the eyes, uh, the different patterns of eyes that they have. Host for satyrs, Appalachian brown, like sedges, grasses, sedges, grasses. And they think that the, um, the Carolina satyr might actually be using stilt grass, which that's the very first thing that I've heard of that's positive about stilt grass. So having, having grasses and sedges in your yard is also um, a good thing to have. So um, there's 250 different skippers in the United States. They're small, they're, they have rapid flight. Um, you have two different kinds, the spread wing skippers. So they are sitting with their wings out. Uh, and the grass uh, skippers, they say look kind of more like a jet plane. So they have two wings that go up and two wings that go out. And they're, they have really short, stout bodies and their bodies are almost as big as their wings are. So spread wing skippers, here's a beautiful long tail skipper that seems to come here in the fall and has this gorgeous kind of bluish green coloring when on its body. The, uh, the checkered skipper, tiny little thing, and the silver spotted skipper you see really frequently um, in gardens. And over at the botanical gardens, there's an American wisteria and there are often um, caterpillars uh, of the uh, silver spotted skipper on that um, large plant um, underneath the, the uh, overhang. So spread wing skippers um, like legumes and senna and American wisteria, mallows, lambs, quarter. This is amaranth, and this is, uh, an, interestingly enough, this is an edible plant. Some of the other plants that they use, and you think of them as being common weeds, are, are edible uh, for us. You can put them in your salad. Um, 
So there's some that uh, there are some of these skippers that like uh, trees as well. Uh, this wild indigo dusky wing typically goes to like this sundial lupin or um, the wild indigo plant, but we have seen it on crown vetch, which is another kind of uh, non-native plant that's taking over the world. Um, grass skippers, uh, some of them, the male and female are um, very different in the way that they look. Uh, and some like this little glassy wing that they're just coming out now, the male and female look relatively the same. You can have very tiny, this is a, a least skipper, very tiny little thing. And you can have skippers that kind of like the uh, edge of the salt marsh uh, rather than uh, coming to the garden. Hosts for grass skippers, panic grass, Bermuda grass, purple top, wild rice sedges. So if you're providing butterflies with hosts, uh, host plants, you've got to have a real variety of things available to them. So herbs, perennials, cover crops, weeds, grasses, vines, shrubs, trees. Um, Some of these plants are better than others. Uh, and I'm gonna show you a few lists of plants that are better than others. You know, some are better than others. This hyssop, um, when it's relatively new, you have these little tiny white flowers up and down it, and it is covered with pollinators. So if you look really closely, you can see a honeybee, and you can see a bumblebee and a carpenter bee. Um, and the butterflies also love this plant. Um, how many people know about the Alianthus or the Aelanthus um, tree and the moth? Um, so Alianthus is the tree of heaven, which is a very invasive tree that came from Asia and um, the spotter and lantern fly uses it as a host. And this moth, which looks like a beetle, also uses it as a host. Uh, this moth has a caterpillar. The caterpillar creates webs. Uh, and um, so a lot of people have a tendency to kill uh, the webworm nests uh, because they think that these are all bad caterpillars. But there is a, 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 a natural, a native uh, tent caterpillar uh, that has a lot of um, hair on it. Uh, but this uh, Alianthus moth caterpillar doesn't have hair on it. So you can tell the difference. Non-native plants that the butterflies seem to love, lantana, they go on it like crazy. Um, the um, mountain mint uh, is just, it gets covered with all kinds of insects. Um, butterfly bush, there's a debate about whether or not butterfly bushes, we should have them or not, um, because they have kind of become uh, very um, invasive in some places in the south where they don't get killed every couple of winters. Um, and um, zinnias are a favorite. So annuals are primarily non-natives in our area, but we found that the amaranth, phlox, lantana, sunflowers, Mexican sunflower, zinnias, those are preferred by the insects as compared to some of the others that are on the right-hand side. Herbs, lots of different herbs um, pollinators are attracted to. Uh, so you can see here on the basil plant and on the chicory and fruit, of course, they're interested in the, the different fruit. These vegetables are also fruit. Uh, perennials, more of the perennials are native plants. And these plants are just loved by the insects. 
So asters, black-eyed Susan, boneset, cone flowers, goldenrods, ironweed, joe pieweed, all the milkweeds, mist flower, swamp sunflower that can grow 12 feet tall, uh, but it is just a wonderful plant uh, for, for butterflies in the late summer. So here are some buckeyes on bone set and um, uh, a, uh, maybe that's a Horace's dusky wing on black eyed Susans and a bee on some asters and mist flower. So there's, what are these? Are they native or non-native? You have, they're all Menardas. You've got a scarlet bee bomb and a wild bergamot and a spotted bergamot. So which, which came first and which ones are native in Virginia? The spotted bergamot is the earlier plant as far as kind of genetically earlier. And that, we do have some of that in our area. Wild uh, bergamot or the uh, kind of the lavender bergamot, you typically find that more native in the mountains, but a lot of people have been using uh, this one um, for butterfly um, meadows because it's such a good attractant uh, and it is really hardy. Um, we, we went to New Jersey to, uh, to visit my father and uh, we found um, a couple of butterfly enthusiasts and we went to visit them and they said, you should go see some of these um, meadows that we have. And the meadows uh, were burned maybe once a year, maybe once every other year. Um, and what is coming up is just a sea of this purple, uh, lavender colored uh, bergamot. And it's just covered uh, with butterflies and, and other insects. The scarlet bee bomb um, is found in Virginia, but we have created like 50 varieties of bee bomb. So we don't know whether or not when we order it or buy it, uh, it whether or not it's native or whether it is a cultivar um, so or a nativar. So all of these plants that we have, we man thinks we can make them better. So we make them better and then we don't really know what happens. Do we change the bloom and the chemistry? And can pollinators actually recognize them as food? Uh, do they have the same ultraviolet characteristics? Um, do, the, do the insects um, like them? Can they use them? Do they work as food? We, you know, we, we don't know. Some of them probably yes, and others maybe not. Shrubs. Um, I took this picture yesterday of an azure on the sweet spire because the sweet spire is blooming. It's very pretty. Button bushes, they're one of my favorites. They're just a lovely bush. Um, when they're in bloom, um, they just attract all sorts of things. Um, and the, the uh, botanical garden uh, has a number of button bushes in it, uh, but they've been trimming them. Uh, so we hope that they'll still be good uh, in the future. Another favorite of mine is Clethra, sweet pepper bush. And um, the dismal swamp is just along the edges of the trenches where the water is. It's just covered with sweet pepper bush. And the butterflies and the other insects, moths, are all over them. Vines. I put a caution with the vines because some of the vines become very um, assertive <laughs> uh, and um, there are other characteristics that make them a little bit um, uh, hard to grow or not, not hard to control rather than hard to grow. So uh, in the right hand upper corner is the cross vine that's blooming in the spring. 
so there's not that very many um, plants that are out there in the spring for the, for the insects. So that's a, a really good one to plant. Um, coral honeysuckle is gorgeous and it attracts hummingbirds when the, when the tubes start to open up. Um, this is a, a native um, uh, virgin's bower or clematis. Um, and there is an Asian clematis and there are places in, um, on Jamestown Island where the foliage is just covered uh, with uh, the Asian variety of, the, of this uh, vine. So they can be really invasive. The um, American wisteria is wonderful and it's, and it's fairly controlled. The Asian wisteria is the one that we see all along the roadsides. If you go to Little Creek Reservoir um, and you go to the park there and you drive in one, um, one of the entrances, all of the trees are covered with this vine and they're being strangled by the vine. So you really do have to watch out. Um, Virginia creeper, some people are allergic to it just like um, poison ivy. So you have to be cautious with that one. Trees um, for butterflies. These are two of my favorite trees. Devil's walking stick is a, is a small tree, but it provides tremendous food for, um, for insects. And in the fall, the berries are wonderful for birds during migration. Uh, and at the botanical garden, we have a meadow area that my husband is kind of in charge of. And um, we put some devil's walking sticks in there so that we would uh, be able to provide uh, nectar and also berries um, for, the, for the fauna. Hackberry trees, uh, they kind of are the host for several different butterflies. These are two different uh, emperor butterflies, and they are going to an area on the tree where there's some nectar. But um, these hackberry trees are just wonderful big old trees, and their bark is kind of knobby. And so sometimes if you're looking for these uh, emperors, you just take your binoculars and you carefully look up and down the tree to see if you can see a wedge sticking out and the butterflies are hanging out on the, on the, uh, the bark of these big old hackberry trees. Trees for bees. Um, this sumac uh, is, it's a, um, a winged sumac. You can see the wings along uh, the edge of the, of, of the stem of the, of the branch. Um, this is not quite open yet, but there is one little bee on it. Uh, we, look, we, we found this bush just covered uh, with, um, with bees. A lot of honeybees and, um, and bumblebees, uh, but thousands of them were on this when it was in full bloom. And if you've walked under a red bud tr tree when it's blooming, you know that it's just covered with insects. So if you're thinking about planting. Uh, you want to try to plant in layers and you want to provide a variety of host plants and nectar plants for uh, the pollinators. Uh, one of the problems that we have in our parks and along our roadsides is that we mow everything right up to the tree line. So there's no place for shrubs or for flowering plants. Um, it's uh, criminal uh, what, we, what we're doing to our environment. We have a lot of threats to our pollinators. Typically they have natural predators like a spider with this butterfly wrapped up in its web. But in addition, we have Invasive plants, we have too much development around here. It's, it's just, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and more land is being used. We have a lot of pesticide use, global warming, disease, parasites, mowing, pollution, you name it, we got it. So this is 
um, near um, the Croker intersection. And this is Kutsu, and it's totally covered. The entire, it's like three or four acres is just covered in Kutsu. And now there's a problem uh, in the south with the Kutsu beetle that is uh, being invasive. Uh, not so fun fact, according to the US Fish and Wildlife Service, homeowners use 10 times more chemicals per acre on lawns than farmers use on crops. So what we can do is if we provide biodiversity, um, the environment, the habitat can take care of itself. So you need to learn to work with nature, use biological controls if you need to, uh, and make sure that you keep your beneficial insects. So what can you do with your gardens and your lawns? There's, there's Gary and his garden. Um, you can enlarge your flower beds. You can reduce your lawn size. You can mow a little bit higher. Um, maybe leave some of the uh, white clover in your lawn and you can avoid indiscriminate killing of insects. You can put some lawn substitutes in, violets, pussy toes, uh, Corsican mint, um, ornamental strawberry, but I've been pulling that out like crazy lately. Um, the, uh, the white clover is actually better to use than the red clover or some of the other um, more manipulated clovers. It's not a native, but it's pretty darn good. Um, it's drought tolerant and um, it fixes nitrogen. So, you know, farmers will plant it and then they'll plow it under uh, so that you can have more um, uh, nutrition back into the soil. You can plant islands. So you can put taller shrubs in the center and then the shorter uh, things around the outside. Now, our, uh, our islands are not quite designed like that, um, but it just goes to show you can put mixed plants together uh, and it can be um, really good for attracting uh, the insects. So um, here is a um, devil's walking stick. And then this is a cup plant. And the cup plant is going to grow almost as tall as that, uh, as that tree. Here's some senna. And over here is a, a vine, is a, is a coral honeysuckle. You can have a water island. And you can pick the, the water plants. This uh, cardinal flower is just wonderful to have as a water plant, and it's going to attract all sorts of pollinators. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a beautiful plant. And I'm surprised uh, this last summer that it, the blooms lasted a really long time. Uh, we kind of collect frogs uh, in this pond. We used to have goldfish, but now it's just frogs and an occasional salamander. What can you do in your garden to attract pollinators? You can learn more about insects and their habits. You can plant food for caterpillars. You can plant in sunny locations. You can plant for continuous bloom. A uh, couple of falls ago, each flower would come out at a slightly different time. And I was absolutely amazed. The asters were out, all of the insects were on the asters. Then the asters kind of dwindled and the um, mist flower kind of took over and all of the insects went to the mist flower. And then when they got really hard up and there was nothing left, they even went to the marigolds. You can provide uh, damp areas and shallow puddles and a flat stone for basking. Um, you can add rotting fruit. So we had a, a pear fall off the pear tree, but the uh, insects loved it. And the butterflies love the sweet things. 
melon and the fruits. You can be an advocate for habitat restoration and preservation. You can talk to your neighbors. You can uh, try to talk to the Department of Motor Vehicles and the um, try to get them to stop mowing the path, the, the um, power lines, the power people. Talk to the park people and other open spaces and try to get them to allow some uh, plants of different kinds uh, to grow. You can advocate for less mowing. Um, and one of our um, expert uh, botanical people, Donna, says that when should you mow? Maybe you should mow like in March after the plants have all gone down in the fall and the insects have used them through the winter and it's now spring and maybe some things are starting to bloom and the insects can move there. So maybe mowing in, in March is a good idea. Um, good to use fewer chemicals to plant in layers, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, there's a lot you can do. Good enough?